So we have a mix of things, did we not? We now know what uh, a high carb diet means to our health. Um, and we know that those fresh foods that we lost between the 1950s and just recently were the mainstay uh, of, what, of what we build our health on. But one of the things that we lost that we desperately need to get back is that fermentation. Fermentation is the oldest preservation method that there is. Canning is about 200 years old. Fermentation goes back to the beginning of human settlement agricultural um, uh, surplus and it had to be preserved through the winter if people were going to stay in that one place and not go hunting nuts and berries in the other places. So um, fermentation is very old. People did not understand the connection with their health, but they knew that it kept their food um, preserved. We now know that, and we lost fermentation really to modern preservation techniques like refrigeration and freezing particularly. And then canning, of course, became even larger. You can buy a fermented product like sauerkraut in, in the grocery store, but what has happened to it? It was fermented, but then it was pasteurized so that it could sit in a can on the shelf. You lose the benefit of the live cultures when you pasteurize something. So um, the idea is just to get back the live culture fermented foods, and you can ferment anything. You all know basic cultured foods, do you not? Yogurt, uh, some of you may know kefir or kefir, which is a type of yogurt. Cheese is a fermented product, soy sauce is a fermented product, fish sauce. Mo many of the things that we eat routinely that we don't even think about as being fermented are. Um, but bringing back live culture fermentation in the home kitchen, it, which is what I'm going to demonstrate, a small piece of it today, is where we get the richest microbial cultures. And that's what we're looking for. Um, to rebuild this gut, and from the gut to rebuild, at the cellular level, the human body, and to change those disease patterns. Um, I think it's just, um, it's a wonderful thing in America today that what's happening is happening. Um, the most hopeful statement I could make is that today doctors are writing cookbooks. Did you know that? And it's not for a hobby. It's not for a hobby. Um, let's see, Deep Nutrition is a young medical doctor, a woman doctor. Why your genes need traditional foods that may include fermented foods. I think the really super amazing thing about that book, Nancy, is that she talks about how you can, how we turn on our diseases and we can and we turn, turn them off. off. And so epigenetics is a very upcoming field. Huge. It's very huge. We thought we are not at the mercy of our genes. We we control whether they're helping us or acting against us, and that is not a, you know, that can change in a very short period of time. Uh, this is uh, an English physician who's had a, an autistic son, uh, and this is the protocol that she developed out of that, which is very broadly applicable to many conditions. The gut and the brain are hugely connected, hugely connected, and she describes that in this uh, gut and psychology syndrome. When we finish in here, I'll move these books out to another table so that it can, because uh, someone's coming in right after us. Um, the disease delusion, uh, Jeffrey Bland is the father or co-founder of functional medicine um, in this country. It goes back to 1991. This book is just out. Uh, he's describing why Disease is, it, we have to name everything. We have to, in modern medicine, we need to name it in order to know how to treat it. If we start, if we start working at the cellular level, rebuilding um, our gut first, and then the cells and the mitochondria and the cells, the body's self-healing mechanism kicks in, right? We, it's almost as though, this sounds far-fetched, but I think we're gonna see it later. We don't even have to know what it is that's wrong if we really work to rebuild ourselves at the cellular level. That's a bit of a stretch so far because uh, we do we do have powerful things that can that can keep people um, um, 
that are needed to take care of the damages that have been done. But when we get our environment um, healthier, uh, I think we can really rely on the body self-healing if we're giving it what it needs. Um, and I want to talk about this one in more detail, but let's, talk, let's make some sauerkraut first. This is nothing but cabbage. How many of you like sauerkraut? Oh, good. <laughs> All right. Um, so a lot of people don't like sauerkraut, but this was one of the simplest things to do. Um, this is one head of cabbage, and we're going to see how it, typically about a head of cabbage will fit into a quart jar. So, um, and one head of cabbage with one tablespoon of uh, sea salt, or non-iodized salt, although that seems to be in question these days, no, whether it's iodized or not. Yeah. What does the iodine do? I have to, I have been taught, and most people in fermentation feel that the iodine, uh, if it's an, an added item, will inhibit the fermentation. Okay? Uh, but I noticed that Dr. Um, uh, Walls says iodized sea salt, and her book is, is new this year too. So that's, you're still sorting things out. Yeah. And I'm still starting to think that iodine can be bad for your thyroid. That, yes. you know, that's counterintuitive because it's added for thyroid purposes, but you have to have a balance. But you it's a balance. if you actually have a thyroid autoimmune disease, which is extremely common today, um, the iodine is extremely bad for you. So you're only using one tablespoon of salt? I think I do two. I, it's, it can vary, but I only use one. But you don't use a starter, right? You're not using I'm not using a starter. You okay. can use a starter, and I'll talk about starters in a minute. But I'm showing you what you can do with a head of cabbage and a tablespoon of sea salt and a quart jar. No water, nothing else. Doesn't have to have a starter. Uh, you can if you want to. If you want to. Um, but. The important thing in fermentation, uh, vegetable fermentation particularly, is that you're going to make sure your vegetables are packed underneath the liquid line, all right? Because you can't have pathogenic microbes growing underneath the water, underneath your, um, the environment. You will get some mold growth at the top of the jar possibly, but not down in the the kimchi or the salad um, Can you talk to us how you keep yours underneath? Because I find that extremely challenging with yes. a lot of different fermenting. I've tried olives recently and they're popping up. Popping up to the top. I, I'll just tell you what I've been thinking. Um, and and I, I, I heard just yesterday, uh, my co-partner in Southern Culture was telling me that Sandor Katz, who is the grandfather of fermentation revival in America, and wrote this wonderful book, was in Mississippi just a couple of weeks ago. He is devising, we need to get together with our potters or our glass makers, yes, mm -hmm. and design the little heavy disc with knobs on the top that you can put down into any size jar to keep the things under the liquid. Just use another smaller jar. To sit, that will sit down into this one. But then it, yeah, yeah. Or, or you could do like a two in Korea. When I was in Korea, I, I saw people basically they had big crocs and a cabbage that they could, yeah, they put a plate and then waited it for yeah, the a big croc then. That because that, so I. That's a great idea, but I was using um, several things. I, there's lots of different ideas <laughs> on the internet, but I took marbles and I wrapped them in cheesecloth and I stuck it in. I went out and found big rocks and I scrubbed them and I boiled them and then I put them in. But you know, I noticed that the quartz space rocks work fine, but the other rocks are they're turning my owl's colors. And I've done it with, with other things too. Yeah. But with the same I have the spores. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Um, glass is the much preferred and safest thing to use around your permits long term. Now, I'm doing this in a stainless steel bowl, but it's not going to stay in here very long. Give me your mailing address and I'll make your glass one. I need to tell you. Start making these. Yes, yeah, you need to it. tap into yeah. the fermentation community and because the great service. Right now, and I have a bunch of wine bottles that are doing other stuff out of that should be. So the oh, ones on the are expensive. They're, they're like, I know, but I'm telling you, they're like fifteen dollars yeah. for a weight, and I thought I'm not paying fifteen dollars for this weight, and so that I did the marbles and other things. But with sauerkraut, I just use the outer leaf. I do too. Um, now, there's a couple of leaves. On, on, you might have. They might be in the trash. Do you want? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll use one of these. Okay. Of these. But you can take the outer leaves off of your head of cabbage and use it as a as a press down into the liquid. It will get quite moldy because that cabbage leaf has a lot of its lactic acid bacteria, which is naturally present on uh, uncooked raw fruits and vegetables, that is the starter for our sauerkraut, okay? That's where the live microbial action comes in. It's what's already here. Sometimes you can see a real sheen on, on cabbage fresh from the field. Those are your, those are your live guys. That's what you're after. Um, but, you can but they're there down. anyway, even if, if you those leaves are gone. You can push down that, that larger um, leaf underneath of the flip. You can. Yes. But it's hard. It's hard. You can do that. You put your the, um okay. I have a new prize that I'm gonna let you sit for a while so that the juice continues to come out, but can you see this had no water in it? The salt draws the liquid out of the cabbage. Okay. And doesn't the warmth of your hands? It probably helps. And also the reason I'm kneading it is that I'm squeezing the salt into the cabbage. Mm -hmm. And it gets very juicy. Uh, but I'm going to let it sit for just a few minutes while we talk. And, uh, and then we're going to pack it in the jar. And that, that is, uh, that's all I have to do. What goes to work after that are your microorganisms, your microbes from the cabbage leaf that are really happy in that salt brine down under the surface. And they will ferment. They are really beginning to digest the cabbage. You know, fermented foods are really a, an external digestion process or a pre-digestion process. And, um, and they're, they're actually creating additional nutrients. Um, in in that process, the same way they would be doing that in your will do that in your gut. So um, on the back of the handout sheet, uh, the front section is just resources that you can go to. My favorite ones, and on the back, uh, there's there is a discussion of the human health benefits of fermented foods. Um, you know. Um, We're really in trouble with our immune systems, are we not? Uh, we're facing serious things like MARSA and, and hospital settings and Ebola and all. Um, mm -hmm. And we think we're going to fix those, and we do have to work very hard on them externally, you know. At times, antibiotics really save us, and we need them, but we've overused them, right? And, and now we're losing their effectiveness. Uh, there we have bugs that are that are mutating faster than we can make the antibiotics for. We're using tons of antibiotics in our animal production, that's a huge problem. Um, so the best defense I can suggest against um, infectious disease would be what? Nutrition. Your mind is a big part. Nutrition is a huge part and rebuilding your gut. I hear so many different figures on this, but between 50 and 90 percent of our immune system is where? It's in the gut. It's in the gut and the lymphatics. Okay? So if we have dysbiosis in our gut, and you don't necessarily have to have symptoms to have dysbiosis, but many people often do, um, we um, we need to pay attention to that and 
and ask ourselves what do we need to do, what changes do we need to make to get a good ecology going in your gut again, because that strengthens our immune systems. You know, two people can be exposed to the same germ, one gets it and one doesn't. Okay? So there's a difference there. We need to be studying as much the people who are not coming down with Ebola as we do trying to save with our suits on and everything. We really, and to the people who survived it. Yes, the pe and the people who survived it, yes, because it's true. The immune system somehow was able to overcome it. Able to overcome it, right. And there are all kinds of factors related to that. I'm not saying that sauerkraut's going to do everything we need. But I'm trying to make a point about, about rebuilding the human gut because that rebuilds human immunity. And it very much has an effect on the mind and how we think. You know, the vagus nerve goes from the brain to the gut, and we used to think that the brain was telling the gut what to do. We now know that most of that information is traveling the other way, from the gut to the brain. And um, it's not just fermented foods, but it's putting allergenic foods. If I'm particularly as sensitive to dairy or to um, gluten, is a huge event in today's world. Um, we need to know those things and to take them out of our diets until we re I think we can rebuild the digestive tract. And when we do that, these food sensitivities will be less. And we may be able to eat some of the foods that we think now we can't. But it's a period of healing that, that we need to be patient with. Um, okay, let's see. Well, that is continuing to make. I'll talk a little bit about starters. Um, a starter culture is simply uh, um, well, different things. This is a purchased starter culture. Uh, this happens to be for uh, a milk ferment called the kefir. Uh, she, this company also makes um, a vegetable starter. Um, whey, liquid whey. People familiar with liquid whey? Okay, it's that liquid that comes to the top of yogurt. That mm -hmm. would make you the most familiar. But if you're a cheesemaker at home or a kefir maker or whatever, you will have tons of whey. Uh, that could be put in here. It could reduce the salt a little bit maybe or um, I don't, I, wouldn't, I don't do it for that reason. Personally, I just like salt and cabbage uh, and caraway seed. You don't have to do this, but it's, it's my favorite um, to add some caraway seed. And the one that you, I hope we have time to do the sample has caraway in it. But it can be just plain cabbage. It could be cabbage and anything else, like um, dill is a good one. Um, celery seed. Celery seed are good. Mm -hmm. um, Okay. Um, <coughs> starters. So you can purchase starters. And there's still, I think, um, controversy in the fermentation community now about whether you should use a starter or not. You can, I don't think there's a should to it. Uh, there is a discussion about whether you have a more known culture if you add a particular starter. You know what you're getting in your culture. Sandor Katz, when he did the presentation in Starkville a couple of weeks ago, he is, his first book was called Wild Fermentation. What I'm doing here is wild fermentation, reducing what comes inherently with the cabbage. Uh, but you can add a starter. I could add uh, a vegetable culture starter like this, the other version of this, or uh, I could put a little play in here. Nancy, um, just to add on to that, I, in the beginning, when I was fermenting, I was doing it with a little whey because it felt safer to me. It just I didn't know. feel as scary. But I didn't realize I was ha reacting terribly to the whey. The dairy. So, yeah. Okay. And so, if you have any dietary restrictions or reactions, really, it's, it's safer to go just with the salt. And honestly, I... Personally, prefer the salt taste versus I do too. Uh, sauerkraut yeah. that's been starting with whey. I do too. Um, sauerkraut with whey to me gets a little too soft and mushy. It has um, a different flavor too. And, and a different flavor. It's all preferential though, mm -hmm. to your taste, to your taste. Um, so, let's see. There's so many other things to say about starters that we can't cover them all in the time that we have. 
I wish, though, that I had brought uh, a kombucha mother. Do people know what kombucha mothers are? Okay. It's a mushroom. It's a SCOBY. SCOBY stands for Symbiotic Colony of Yeast and Bacteria. Uh, and it's, it's a little pancake, kind of like a gummy bear, <laughs> that texture. But it covers, it covers the, uh, if you're making um, kombucha, you're making a liquid, a drink. Uh, and traditional kombucha is made from sweet tea, black tea with sugar, like we love here in the South. Uh, and you put a scoby on the top and you let it sit for about a week and it turns it into a wonderful drink, uh, somewhat fizzy. Um, and the sugar that's in there, which is about a cup for a gallon, and we know we don't need all that sugar, don't we? Um, but the mite, that's what the scoby does, it eats it up. It uses that sugar for its own energy and it produces a drink that is healthier for us. Okay. Uh, this is not this has not been produced by SCOBY, but but when you see when you see people making kombucha, it's usually in a big jug and it's got the SCOBY floating on the top. But for starters, for kombucha, you can just use a kombucha that hasn't been pasteurized because apparently GTs now won't work. But you can use a, a another kombucha, maybe a local kombucha. You don't have to have the SCOBY on top; it'll grow its own. Just it will grow. So you pour it, pour it, and yeah, we'll it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
quarter cup. A quarter cup? Yeah. It's just a tea. A quarter to a half cup. A it's just a tea to start out. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. It doesn't take a lot. Because so I was going to make some cheese and then have to put it away And I was thinking, oh, oh yeah, I can use yeah. that. Yeah. Well, no. No. Um, let's see. No, would you, since we're getting so close to time, would you just pass some samples for people? Um, the amazing thing about fermentation is that um, um, is that you can do so much with it. Um, Anybody know what beauty berry is? Maybe it has another name here, but it's out in the wild here in Mississippi. Yeah. I, you can you can harvest from the wild many things. Sumac is another wild thing that grows all around us. You can turn these into kombuchas or white coolers. Um, they're really beautiful things to do. Um, I'm afraid. Of um, no, Nancy, where do you buy the liquid waste? You can't buy liquid waste. You're going to have to. This is where community grows. You're going, you're going to have to find someone who has it. Or you can go to the grocery store and get um, a, a really good like Greek yogurt and strain it in, in a cheesecloth. And, and what drips out of that will be white. Um, yeah, but you have to do Don't you have to do a lot of culture? You know, I don't want the... the, the um, you want maybe one of the really good yeah. 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 do you can do you all have seven yeah. stars down here Nancy yeah. yeah. uh, seven stars do you have the seven stars yeah. here down here it's a good one um, it is a good one really if you have anybody that's doing raw milk or raw milk yogurt that's really where you want to get it from but uh, it's probably it just under that, just the camera. Oh, oh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I see this, this one tether on average. They have a cast That one did have a cast So I can help from outside. The important thing is that I have pressed that down very carefully. I've gotten all the bubbles out. I just put them down. Yeah, on about day three, as this sits to ferment, it's going to bubble, and you need to burp it, all right, and let that air out. Otherwise, it's going to overflow. Um, so I usually put mine in a saucer or a bowl as it's uh, as it's fermenting. Wait, how long does it sit for? So Nancy, you, you don't sure. have the liquid covering the top, okay. it's okay? Because I'm always nervous about that. I don't think you need to be that nervous. Okay. You could, I don't like to open them up and open them up and open them yeah. up. When you do open them up, yeah. you can take a spoon or a very clean hand and then press it down again. <laughs> but this is where we need the way. Right, right. And that's when I take the, the whole weed and I just press it down and then it allows for the liquid to be over. That's good to know. Yeah, one of the things that I spent way too much money on the internet uh, was for the little system that has the um, cap with the whole airlock. Yes. And the you can, you know, yeah. that. you can do that. You can do, you know, a lot of people, do it in crops and do just what you said, the way on the plate. There are many, many ways to do this. The important thing is, is to try to keep things down under the liquid in whatever fashion you can and to either burp it every now and then to let the air out, all right, or get an air lock or use a slightly open like crop with the, the plate and the weight on it. So what you'll see is that top will start bubbling up because it's yes. got pressure in it and you have to release it. Yeah, you have to release it. But I've never used the airlocks. I just was, they were too expensive for me. Yeah. I just thought, All right. If you have a yes. room, how long do you let it sit? All right, this is a good question. How long do we, how long do we let this sit? Uh, at about a month's time, uh, it is thought that the, the microbial culture is the richest. However, you can eat it the next day. <laughs> it's just salty cabbage the next day. I like mine, I, I might sometimes start eating mine a week out 
because so it's preferential. It's what it's subjective to what your tastes are and what you're trying to accomplish. So if you're doing this to rebuild your gut, you might want to go closer to the one month. There's some people that would let it go two months or more. They would have it in cool storage in the basement. Um, and, and, and really, this was to take cabbage through the winter time in cultures that needed to be able to do that. Andy Guffman, that is a big fermenter, he leaves his stuff on his counter for a year and eats it the whole year. And he says, do you really think of it? Because I'd always taken mine after a month and put it in the fridge. What's the longest you've ever done that? A sauerkraut? So let it sit. So, yeah, um, I've probably not gone more than two months on it. And sometimes, I used to, at the end of what I thought was the fermentation period, I would put it in the refrigerator. I don't really like to do that anymore, although you can. It slows down the process. Temperature and time are the two things that you learn to work with uh, when you're fermenting. Um, you can do that. I just have a dark uh, cupboard a pantry off the kitchen, and that's where I store mine. Is it particularly cool? Or? It's cooler than the rest of the house, uh -huh. but I'm, I'm conscious in the summertime that it's not as cool, mm -hmm. and so the time is going to get faster. Um, yeah. How much you eat daisy? The difference between what's that? So you know that because you yeah. said how long? Your color is going to change. This I did this one on ten too, so it's a little more than a lot. You're going, you will get some color change. Thank you. Um, and I wanted you to be able to taste, but we're so tight for time. Um, any questions about what you sample? Uh, the beet was salty. Does it stay that salty even without keeping the process? Um, yes, I think that it does. You could probably use less. In a half gallon of, of making beet sauce, this is a gallon, but a half gallon has three quarters to a tablespoon. A three quarter tablespoon and a half gallon. And I think you could do less, and like, like uh, Devana was suggesting, traditionally, or some people are doing it without, without salt, or with less salt. And how long do you think you do that before you take the beets out? Just general. Um, I usually start checking it at about five days, but it's five to seven days is what most recipes say. And on the weather. Right. And on the weather and the temperature. Right. You know, fermentation is really making us functional again, is it not? We have to pay attention to our environments. Um, do you have a question on one of these? Yes. What is unit that? Is it carrots? If you were a student in a dorm room and you didn't have a kitchen, you could take carrots, cabbage, uh, well, cabbage too, but cabbage, uh, carrots, cauliflower, any raw vegetable that you like, put it in a clean jar, pour in salt water, and that's three uh -huh. tablespoons per quart of salt water, and let it sit. And then about four or five days, you've got cultured, um, probiotic rich um, snack food. Three tablespoons. To for for this. No, well, of what? To water. To water. And if this oh, is oh I hear you. I hear you. And is this the book you recommend for most of these instructions and recipes? No, this, I don't, not this, I would go more to the websites that I gave you, okay? okay? Uh, this is not so much a recipe book as a discussion of all of the ways that human cultures around the globe and with all foodstuffs have fermented through so it. Really. It's not really a how-to, really. It does have a lot of how-to, but you'll have to be patient with teasing it out. But it's a very well done book. I want to bring your attention to one other. This book is just out. Terry Walls is a medical doctor, a woman doctor in Iowa, who was diagnosed at the age of 52 with multiple sclerosis. She progressed with, with her conventional, with her best of medical care. Uh, she was in a wheelchair for four years. Um, she decided that she wasn't getting better. She went to research herself on what was known about MS in the brain. Discovered that mitochondria played a huge role. Mitochondria are the little energy producers in our cells. So she went to supplements, uh, good quality nutritional supplements, and she halted the progression of her disease. All right. 
but she only halted it. Then she went to Whole Foods, like nine cups of fresh fruits, vegetables, berries, well-grown plus some grass-fed meats and, and essential fatty acids. Uh, <clears throat> and she reversed it. She used to be a marathoner before she got MS. Um, and now she's back to riding her bike again. So, and she's also doing clinical trials out in Iowa and showing that in all our autoimmune diseases, the multiple sclerosis, the um, lupus, the rheumatoid arthritis, the same thing is happening at the cellular level. It's just expressing itself differently in the human body based on our genetics and how we've been exposed or exposed our genes to different things. So, and we're also looking at all other chronic diseases and, and, the, and what cells look like in those and realizing that if we can change ourselves at the cellular level with real and whole food, and she has an entire section on recipes at the back, this is what I mean by doctors who are writing cookbooks, to tell us how it is to heal ourselves. And this is why it's so important to have our local food agriculture regenerated. We are not going to heal ourselves with nine cups of fruits and vegetables from industrial agriculture. I'm sorry, it just doesn't work that way. We don't have the nutrient density, and we have the toxicity that comes with that. So we really need those small farmers with good, sustainable methods to grow our health for the future. Uh, and it's doctors like this who are putting aside, well she doesn't put aside her pills, she still uses them because she still has people who come and who need that. Um, but her clinical trials are really amazing and showing us that so much of chronic disease can be reversed uh, when we work with, with food and environment. It's not just food, you have to get the, you have to clean up your, your daily act with your, the things that you're being exposed to, the heavy metals, the chemicals, and so forth. But what does that do? But each of us goes home and decides to do that in our personal lives. It cleans up the planet. It cleans up the marketplace. It greens the marketplace. I just, it's so hopeful what we can do today. It, it really is. There's a lot of bad stuff happening around us. But I think we can change all of that. And I think we do it one person at a time. Maria? Now, those drinks over there, I came in on the tail end. So you're saying okay, the naked and the other ones? Yeah. Um, would you have me? These are just commercially available uh, cultured foods, fermented foods. I got these two at Rainbow yesterday. This is a kombucha, by the way. Not minus its mother. It's GT, right? GT? Isn't that a GT product? I don't know. What is no, GT? GT is the brand, and no longer can you start kombucha off of GTs because they started because to they had to. So just so I've, so I've started them off the GTs. In the past, lately it has. Wait, what's yeah, it it's, it's because, it's because of what? With every they're, brand. They're, they're not pasteurized. You can oh, okay. blow one up if you leave it in your car. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> they say that sitter mist takes a lot longer and it has it's to not as the good, wall sitter. Yeah, no, they, yeah they're, that's they're, alcohol exactly content. Right. They're, they're definitely right. not as probiotic as they used to be, but you can start, you can start one with one. If you're patient. If it's got enough in the I would just go towards a local kombucha versus the GTs because I think the local will give you more of what you're looking for. And, and, I, and I think doing this in your home kitchen, if by any way you can do it, it's so much better. This is amasaki. It is, it is a sweet, it's rice, a sweet rice, a variety of rice, sweet rice, that um, has a starter added to it. That's all it is. It is so sweet. It has no sugar added, and that means no artificial sugar is added to. It, uh, the sweetness comes out of the rice itself. So these these are available um, in the store. Um, let's see, I wanted to let you taste the sauerkraut, but I don't think we really have time. I'll put I'll find a place to put it in, on a conference table, and you can people can sample it out there. Nancy, can I have that? For, I'm, unfortunately, I have an autoimmune disease, and and it's all based in my gut. It's celiac. And I've been on a healing path for a couple of years. And so I would just want to warn folks that if you're not used to eating sauerkraut and you eat yes. a large quantity of any fermented food, 
you will likely have die off because what's happened is your gut ecology mm -hmm. is out of balance and so it will be you so they say there's good and bad bacteria but truly we have uses for all these bacteria but if you have a proliferation of one bacteria over another and it's out of balance the sauerkraut is going to help you the fermented foods are going to help you rebalance but if you do it, do it in a large quantity is going to help you in a way that's going to make you violently ill to your gut. So just take <laughs> it. <laughs> Usually people have horrendous diarrhea. So take it slow is what I'm saying. If you're, if you, if you have any gut issues, take it slow. If you are have a pretty healthy gut, hard on. Yeah, if it's you're awesome not, for you. If you're not sure, just ease into it, and and your body will tell you yeah, if it's exactly. too much. Your body will tell you. Um, and I'd also like to point out, Patrick is sitting here reminding me, Rainbow does live culture uh, crafts and pickles and so forth, and they have a wonderful section there. And those are made in the store, right, Patrick? Yeah. So that's like your home kitchen. If anybody wants a glass one, well, if you're watching the address down, I'll see what I can do when I get back home in about three weeks. That's a good idea. I will